Tilburg University presents Taisig Talks, the podcast that keeps you updated on the latest developments in the field of artificial intelligence in just one hour. Welcome uh, to this Taisig podcast. Uh, my name is Peter Sponk. I'm a professor of computer science. I'm here with Eric Postma, who is a professor in artificial intelligence and uh, Anuj Puri, who is a postdoc researcher in uh, the Tilburg Law School. Uh, the topic of today is ChatGPT. And the reason I want to discuss ChatGPT is the following. Um, about three months ago, ChatGPT caught the public eye. It exploded on the internet. People started discussing it, started using it. There was a lot of enthusiasm. And as somebody who knows a little bit about these kind of technologies, I thought this will last a month and then it will die down. So I didn't see really a lot of value in spending a TISIC talk on it. But I was wrong. Uh, uh, actually, ChatGPT continued to grow. Uh, more and more people look at it. We have different companies investing in it. So originally OpenAI developed ChatGPT, but Microsoft and Google are developing their own variants of a tool like this. And that's why I thought it might be a good idea to discuss it in this particular to explore the, the limitations and the opportunities of ChatGPT and also the dangers and chances that it will give us. So that is what I want to talk with you about. Um, I think that it's a good idea to start with discussing what ChatGPT actually is. And when you uh, work with ChatGPT, then it very often says, I am a large language model developed by OpenAI and I cannot do, cannot do this or something like that. <laughs> um, so, but, but it doesn't really tell us a lot, a large language model, what is that? And I think I have to look at you, Eric, uh, to talk about that. So can you tell us a little bit about what that actually is and how it works? Yeah, so there's a whole evolution in AI and it started with the basic large language models, which were trained on huge collections of, of text uh, using machine learning or deep learning, as it is called. And normally what you need to train these systems is, for instance, you have examples and labels. For instance, for image recognition, you have cats, pictures of cats and dogs. And you have to tell the system, this is a cat, this is a dog. Uh, and the same with text, you would like to enter text and then label that for this. Is this is a good sentence or this is a, a non-grammatical sentence. And it was quite difficult because you had to collect all these labels. So they came up with this idea of self-supervised learning, which means that you give, you, you have a whole sentence or, 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 or a paragraph and you present part of it to uh, the machine learning, the deep learning algorithm that has to uh, predict the next word or the next words. That was the original idea behind the lang large language models. And this allowed you to train them on huge collections of text because the labels were already part of the text. And the label is the thing you have to predict. So that was the first thing. And these models were already very powerful. But now what this latest development is, is that they put something on top of, the, of it that allowed these models to have a conversation, to have a dialogue with, with the human. And they used humans to train the system or to tune the system to these dialogues using a slightly different learning technique. Uh, but in fact, the power of the model is this enormous amount of linguistic information that is collected from the internet and many other sources. And this is, they always say it's the complete internet. I don't know, but it, it's huge what they use for that. And uh, how you should imagine this model internally is that it's a model with a lot of little knobs that you can turn and not thousands, but millions or maybe even billions of these knobs that you can turn. And somehow in this model with all these knobs which control how the input is mapped onto the, the, the words that come next is uh, not transparent. It's a kind of a mathematical operation that happens there in these models. And how you do this, the setting of the knobs is done with a learning algorithm, which is uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to, to uh, find the proper settings. But if you do this for a long time, this training, and use a lot of uh, computer uh, resources, you get a model that can uh, predict the proper words that come next. And these proper words are based on this huge database of information on text that has been collected from the internet. Okay, um, I think it still went fairly deep what you were saying now. Um, so if I try to summarize that a bit, yeah. so basically a large language model is something that can predict 
the next word based on what came before it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one element of it. So probably you give a prompt to ChatGPT, you type something you in type something, yeah. and tell me, uh, please summarize for me uh, 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 to kill a mockingbird. Uh, and then it will start doing something because that is that prompt will then tell you, okay, the answer should start with this word and then this word should follow. It's probably a little bit more complex than that, but yeah. that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, so a simple idea is suppose you store in a huge database, all the information on the internet and you ask this question, can you summarize it? It could search on this in this database if this question is there with the answer because somebody ever asked this on the internet. That would be uh, the kind of naive approach and that's not what's happening in these models, but it's, it's, it's comparable in the sense that it's abstracting away from these things. And it's in fact a huge statistical model that learns to, to generate the answers that you're, uh, that, uh, as a reply to your question. And those little knobs that you were talking about, they, they are tuned yeah. and they are tuned to do what? To give the proper answer. And what is important to realize is that these models have no sense of the world. They, their, their world consists completely of text. So it's not like humans that read text, because if you read a book, you understand the book. No, this is just a machine that knows if I see these words or these sentences, this is a natural completion of the sentence. Or if I get this question, this is a natural way of answering it. Mm -hmm. And not natural in the semantic sense, in the understanding sense, but natural in the sense that this is an adequate answer. But it seems to me, and I think that's where we should end with a technology discussion, is uh, if you want to tune these knobs, then you have to tell the model what a good tuning is. So uh, you generate something and then this is the next word that is going to generate, but it doesn't. And actually, you have to tell no, no, that's not the right word. It should be a different word. So then you can tune some knobs and then you get maybe a different word. So how does it know so oh, if, that is, if that is known? Yeah, for ChatGPT, there are two phases. The first phase is just uh, learning this sentence or paragraph completion. Well, then you know what the answer is because that's in the text. But that's not enough because for ChatGPT, you have these interactive Things, interactive modes. So they used humans, humans that trained the system and kind of nudged the systems in giving uh, proper answers to questions uh, so that you can maintain a dialogue. And I think the memory of these systems that they go back in text, uh, I think about 3000 characters or something like that. So it's also limited in this memory, but it's, it's trained by humans to uh, nudge it into in terms of a dialogue. And that's that's because you cannot learn that from text. Sure. How many humans? I have no idea. It was not disclosed. <laughs> At least I couldn't find. <laughs> but I guess a lot. Okay. Is there anything you want to add uh, to this? So you were making notes. <laughs> no, I I I don't have um, anything specific on the technical aspect. But I would like to pick up the discussion slightly on the ethical front because that's what I'm interested in. In terms of my research, uh, in terms of the humans involved in training of this, I mean, there's a larger conversation to be had in terms of the social license or the social aspects of firms involved in development of disruptive AI. But beginning from a very specific instance, there was this remarkable report, a very moving and horrifying report in time about the exploitative labor practices that were deployed in labeling of data sets, yes. uh, uh, which were used for training chat GPT in Kenya, where workers were paid for about, if I recall correctly, $2 an hour. And their job was to label these horrific images so that the model could learn in terms of or, 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 or what would perhaps amount as a hate speech. And the model could learn and not spew out venom, so to speak, not to spread misinformation. And that is an extremely troubling aspect. Um, we place a premium on human values. We place a premium on developing products ethically. We place a premium on making AI trustworthy. But usually our analysis is focused in terms of the end user. But all that is happening in the background and the entire development process, which as Eric was mentioning is shrouded in uh, the secrecy the violations which are happening there, I think that should be as much as part of the conversation when we are looking at these models and their impact on society. 
Sure, and um, I can imagine, especially now, other companies trying to develop their own models that they are gonna do the same things because they probably yeah, know maybe, a bit. Maybe you have to make. So I, I huh? fully agree with this, but you have to realize that these models are no mysteries. Everybody can do yeah. this. It's just a matter of resources, uh, sure. and both computational resources and humans. So it's not that. The, so the secrecy is. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's deliberate secrecy. It's like Facebook also has these people. I think Content in the Philippines yes. that have to learn that you cannot uh, allow naked images on on Facebook unless it's this iconic image of this girl in Vietnam after a na napalm attack, which is a cultural thing, which is very hard to uh, explain to other cultures. So these, I, I can see all these obstacles, but um, the only point is that the secrecy does not pertain to the technology itself, because that's very open. Everybody knows how you do this, but not everybody can. Okay. Um, so again, I think we can go back to the ethics uh, a lot in this discussion. Um, but uh, one thing that I would like to get a grip on uh, is what ChatGPT can and cannot do, or tools like that, and especially what they can't do because they get ascribed so many possibilities. Uh, um, and now, I leave it to you to come up with examples here because I have plenty of them. If you cannot think of anything, then <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah, maybe it's good to start with what it can do because the emphasis sure. now in also in the, the public domain is on what it can do and what the dangers are. And I, to a large extent, I agree. But I think if you look from the perspective of it, I've been working in AI for a long time and that this is now possible that you can automatically generate text that seems to make sense, although it doesn't, can be a very powerful tool for all kinds of purposes. So people that normally write texts, they can use this as a, uh, uh, as a kind of first draft of the text. Of course, I'm aware of all the limitations there, so we have to address them. But in, from a technical, technological perspective, I think this could develop into something that is very useful for text writing, for coding, you know, you can generate a kind of draft for the code. Uh, computer code, I mean, uh, and uh, and I guess in the future will you also already saw these movies that can be generated and images. So that will be the future. The the main challenge for and I think that's not a challenge for AI researchers only. That's a challenge for all disciplines. Is how do we deal with all the ethical and practical and um, yeah, cultural problems involved with it, the technology. And uh, but I see a lot of potential applications, and I'm sure that in in so I, I'm not so convinced that this is a kind of hype, but of course it's hyped, but this is just a sign of technology that's moving forward and that will affect our way, uh, the way with which we uh, interact with technology. So the, for instance, one, one example I always mention is this idea that you have in these movies of Harry Potter, these talking paintings, you know, that's something that um, could also uh, happen in the future that you come home and you have this screen with your favorite character and it interacts with you and can, can ask it questions. And you know that the question, the answers are not always correct, uh, and sometimes it's this 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 virtual character does not understand our world because it's not based on our world. But it can be a kind of Google search engine, but in a more flexible way. That's my my pitch, and that's the positive sign. So I see that can benefit many scholars, many uh, in many jobs. I can see how this could contribute. Anuj, uh, anything you want to add in this, or especially the, the, what it can do, what is good for? Then we get to what it can't do. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I'm quite interested in chat GPT and its successor models from the perspective of learning. Let's begin on the problems that it has raised for all academics, for universities and for school teachers. And let's see if there is a more positive outcome that we can think of. The obvious concern that all of us have at the moment is in terms of plagiarism. And I think much has been said about that, so I will not address that at the moment. But I do see a positive contribution in terms of learning. If I could intuitively dif divide learning, the process of learning at three stages, one in terms of initial introduction and then grappling with conceptual issues with some degree of knowledge and finally de developing a better understanding. I think a large language model like ChatGPT particularly has beneficial inputs at the first and the third stage. 
If, for example, I do not know anything about social psychology and I want just a primer, a general introduction, and assuming that the information which is given is reliable, mm -hmm. then the succinct summary of what social psychology is all about, that could be a great way of learning about a new subject. Similarly, for an expert to get a pinpointed answer to an esoteric query, mm -hmm. that could be of great help. But in the medium, in the midsection, where the epistemic labor is actually involved, where we are working our way through the problems, mm. where, I mean, uh, there's this famous thought experiment that philosopher Robert Nozick proposed in terms of experience machine, and it was in terms of hedonistic tendencies that if there was hypothetically a pleasure machine, that an experience machine that could give us the sense of joy, the sense of satisfaction that we wanted after, let's say, becoming a world-renowned athlete or going through any kind of profound uh, experience, even though we did not actually go through the experience mm. or did not put in through the labor, is anything lost in the process. Yeah. And I think similarly an analogy can be made. And Nozick argues that something profound is lost in the experience because we do not become that person. No. So similarly, in terms of the epistemic labor which is involved, the transformation, the struggle that we go through in terms of learning, before we actually begin to understand a concept. Yeah, but okay, so um, actually what you now say <laughs> is something that actually then ties back to uh, at the start because you say, uh, okay, if we, uh, if it, uh, yeah, I'm a, a novice yeah. and I ask what is social psychology and I get an answer and yeah. it's I can read it nicely. Say so if it's reliable, yeah. but I think that is the whole point. It's <laughs> not reliable. Is it reliable? And then, and uh, so that is the question, is it reliable? And then the thing is, of course, that if that's that middle part of the process, you start learning, yeah, then if you, if you learn, you could assess whether it's reliable. Exactly, <laughs> but that's, yeah. and that's what I tell the the university people that are concerned about ChatGPT. I think let students give them a ChatGPT essay on a topic and let them score it and indicate where the things are wrong. Because academics should be able to verify information. Good. That's the learning, <laughs> and not that you take over and you you try to protect it or prevent it from happening. Because yeah. you cannot prevent it from happening, and of course these systems will be completely better in the future. But I would never trust them. <laughs> no, the funny thing is, I, I also source. thought that I thought, okay, the, the thing is, if you that did send your students home and say write an essay on this topic, and you get these essays back, and you're not going to read them in detail, yeah. and you cannot really assess whether yeah. they got ChatGPT to write the essay for them or they themselves. However, if you say this was generated by ChatGPT, now indicate everything that is correct and what is not correct, then you can grade it again and you can test whether they and have And these are academic <laughs> skills you have to develop. So, 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 so that's a nice hack. Instead of us worrying about whether the it's, answer is no, no, from it's not from ChatGPT, then a, the question come from ChatGPT. Yeah, it's not a hack, so, it's a thing that prepares your, you for the future because these systems are here and they yes. will be there all yes. the time. And it's not only the case for ChatGPT. Yeah. Yet. There's a lot of news outlets Absolutely. for which the same applies. So, so uh, I would like to briefly address in terms of why, perhaps you're right in terms of saying that some of the information which is provided is not reliable. And I think there is uh, uh, there are at least two reasons for that. One, of course, we do not know much about the training data set, and even if we did know, the way the output is presently managed. It does not attribute sources. And once the output is sans the sources, it is ethically problematic. Firstly, non-attribution of sources, we cannot identify who the original author is. And secondly, it takes away that element of trust. It, it, it makes that information less reliable. So those are two significant uh, points of improvement for all successive models to come. I do see a positive contribution. I, I, I think at some point in time, universities or academia in general would have to come come up with, grapple with the question of the distinction between learning and assessment and chat GPT and its models are pushing our hand on that. But there are some positive in terms of outcomes in terms of learning here. Yeah. Okay. But if the information is not reliable, yeah. how can you 
But I mean, I think that is then an issue. So because I said, what can you do with it and what can't you do with it? Yeah. If you cannot get a guarantee that the information is reliable, yeah. then is that, would that be possible to create a, a version of ChatGPT that is generating reliable information? I think not through this route, because the whole idea of ChatGPT is using lots of data without any knowledge or sense of the world. So not, I always tell students, it took you at least 18 years to understand your environment and your culture. And that's a, any biologist or psychologist knows this. It's a very complex world. And sometimes engineers, I don't want to generalize, but sometimes engineers don't appreciate this complexity because they think, oh, this is a very complicated model and we have Watson and we have this and that. But I think you should appreciate this is impossible. And if we want to have sources, then for instance, Google, although there might be biases there often, if you ask a question, you get websites. And if it's from a trusted resource, you are at least sure that it's, it's something that is scientifically very verified or, or there's another authority who verifies it. But these systems don't have that. And one of the funny thing was that in to, when ChatGPT came up and there was this story that uh, Google was very alarmed by this. And by the way, Google has uh, maybe an equally powerful model yeah. itself. So, But the, the story in the, uh, in the newspapers was that they were uh, alarmed because this could uh, be a competition for the search engine. And I don't think that's true because it's it's in no way a search engine. It's just an hallucination machine. And that could be good for brainstorming or getting out a draft or something, but it's not replacing anything that you, for what you need human knowledge or at least human verified knowledge. And I don't see how you can train these models. Of course, there are attempts to do that, but how do you train these models to make sure that they always are uh, uh, certified or verified? It's a possibility because I, so that's one thing that I was wondering about and I have some idea and maybe one of you knows the answer, but um, they indeed say so both Google says that and Microsoft says that, that they want to integrate that technology with their search engine. So what do they hope to achieve by doing that? Because in principle, if you use a search engine, you get information, you see where the information is coming from and you can make a decision whether or not you think that information is reliable. Um, so what do we try to do? Right. I think that the challenge is the dialogue. So now we have a one shot thing. We type in a query and in Google, you get an answer. And it's not always correct, but it's in the proper direction. And people who are skilled in Google can do that quite quickly, but not everybody. In the future, you have this dialogue, maybe a textual dialogue. And in the further future, you have these interactions with maybe avatars or something. But I think the dialogue thing is important. And what they try to do, I guess, but I'm not, I'm not part of Google or whatever, is that in each feedback that you get, there are links to websites. So the integration of this uh, chat GPT like system with the search engine. Okay. And I think that's already happening. Yes. If you try Google, you will see that. That's, uh, so, so it's, uh, so, sorry, uh, I don't think it's in Google, but it's in Binge uh, yeah. that uh, the model, which is better than uh, chat GPT and uh, they've integrated it and it resulted in some bizarre uh, <laughs> answers as well. I think there was an interesting article in New York Times about the, uh, the, the, the search. Uh, I think the internal name for this project was given as Sydney, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and it was trying to, you know, uh, convince the columnist of its personality and its likes and dislikes and whether it it has emotional attitudes and whether it likes the user and vice versa and stuff like that. So it's a, it was a bizarre experience for the columnist and they have taken some steps to mitigate uh, some of these uh, outcomes. I think now the queries are limited to five if you're using the chat mode in search. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it would be interesting to see how in the future instead of, uh, and, and this goes back to the epistemic labor part, where you go yeah. through the search uh, results and you come up with an answer, which in some sense is a mix of your own thinking and learning, which has taken uh, place with the uh, help of the search, as opposed to this chat, this dialogue, which is taking place. So that is the first major threshold, I think, uh, which the significant uh, outcome which we can look forward to, uh, whether it's a desirable outcome, 
I don't know. No, but it sounds it sounds uh, uh, definitely as something that could work. That you have a conversation. In the conversation, you make clear what your questions are. These questions, yeah, and, then, and you get the links to the websites, which um, might be an answer to your question, which is laid out in some way in the text that you get back. So I can imagine something there. Um, I think a problem is, but that might that you might, might need to turn more knobs or that you uh, might need to do a different kind of training. But I think an, an issue is here that I notice of ChatGPT at least that if you don't give it any hints for what you think the answer is, then it will come up with a completely generic text. Yeah. And if you give it hints, it starts to confirm what you are saying. Yeah. Confirmation bias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not automation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's actually not what you want with a search engine, I would say. No. You, that is usually you have, you have a question, you yeah. don't know the answer. Yeah. No, I think the, the, I, I happen to know that uh, Facebook, but also Google, are actually interested in making this interaction more natural. Yeah. So language understanding, hence the lang large language models, implies that you understand the question of the user. So now we type in keywords, now well, in Google you, in, and then Bing uh, probably also and others, you can make sentences and this could be extended in a more elaborate, more precise sentence. That's the real value, I guess. But uh, I think that the, the rest is problematic because of this I mean, for fact finding, if you really want to get a real answer to your question, these are problematic techniques. I, that's why I see the more as creative things you can use to, to help your creation process in writing or sure. images or movies or whatever. Yeah, I've seen experiments with that as well. So people say, okay, I want to create a short story. I want to create a, yeah. a, a game and, and, and then, okay, generate me a text that is about this topic and you get a text, although I still think the texts are reasonably bland. Sometimes there are nice ideas in there, so, yeah. but, but that is in areas where there is no fact, it's just all fiction. So as soon as you talk about facts, then, and may, maybe here is then the big problem with something like ChatGPT, but I would like to hear your opinion, that is that the, the understanding is still in the human. Yeah. So you cannot offload your understanding to ChatGPT because it doesn't have it. Exactly. And I think that's one of the problems of the image of AI and many discussions of AI is not grasping this. And I think that's sometimes pushed by these companies that want to, this is intelligent technology and the words we use, we, we say, okay, this machine recognizes this picture, which is not true. It's, it's something else. And what we do, we recognize a picture and we know everything about the picture, but this machine is just mapping visual characteristics on a concept. So the nature of what we call understanding is totally different from what's happening in the machines. And that's why I emphasize this is this called mapping. Uh, it, it uses much more information than we can ever use. We cannot read everything on the internet, but it lacks understanding. It has no common sense. And that's, um, it, it, once you know that and accept that, you have different expectations about this technology. I don't have expectations that it can ever understand our world if you proceed in this way. It would require such a system to be embedded in our culture, to grow up in our culture. Um, and you know, you know, from if you come from different cultures, it's very hard to understand another culture if you didn't grow up in this culture, because it's a totally different bias world um, in terms of the things you learn about how you deal with other people or how the world is organized, maybe religion. So there's a huge imprint that we have as humans and you cannot compare that to this textual input and even code and, and images that these machines get from the internet. It's a totally different way of learning and acquiring information. I think um, the question of understanding is an interesting one. Uh, one way of addressing it, and somebody who is more specialized in philosophy of language would perhaps be a better person to answer this, but one way of addressing the issue is in terms of referent. When a human being refers to a table, the referent is a real object in, in the world in which the human being is embedded in. Mm -hmm. When a large language model refers to a table, it's a probability in terms of, well, a four leg object made of wood is called and that the most probable answer is a word table. So in that sense, uh, the name escapes me right now, but there's a wonderful paper which came out recently in terms of talking about large language models. I'm sorry, I forget the name of the author. 
and there this point has been made wonderfully in terms of how it would be wrong on our part to transpose our human intuitions in terms of understanding, in terms of uh, uh, how we understand conversations. And uh, so to that extent, I think the question of understanding requires, uh, we almost need a different vocabulary to explain uh, the associations, the linkages which are happening in large language models. Mm -hmm. These are useful shortcuts to say that whether the large language model understands, but the human intuition behind that or the intentional stance, as uh, uh, Daniel Leonard puts it, is, is not a correct one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have lots of topics which, uh, which we can talk about. Um, are there things that you want to add on things that you cannot do with it? or the limitations, uh, or shall we continue with something Yeah, I think else? in general, anything that requires common sense or, or world knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, I mean, that is that is one of the, the, the big problems, I think, because these big companies, that is how they try to create interest for their technology. And that's at least my impression that they do yeah, that. But, yeah, but that's on the positive side, I think. There's a lot of potential applications of ChatGP. My, my expectation is there will be companies and they're already there. For instance, you have a Dutch version now for this, uh, which is for the Dutch language domain. You can automatically generate text for a specific domain. You can fine tune these models quite well on, for instance, the text domain or or any other thing where you need to generate text. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of professionals will use this as an extra tool in their toolbox to, to quickly, uh, the, the copywriters, they, they quickly have to generate a text, they ask an outline or maybe an introduction or maybe the entire text and then revise it. And it's the same with this uh, stable diffusion and this DALI yeah. uh, model that uh, artists now are, uh, you used to be uh, as an artist, a good visualizer, but now you have to come up with very smart textual prompts to generate. Yeah, I'm wondering something about that. And that, that's also, of course, I have not seen everything, what you can do with it. And I've done a little bit of ex some experiments, but for instance, the generation of text, uh, I read by a journalist and she wanted to have an article written and she used ChatGPT to get that done. And then she said, but afterwards the editing of that article took me far more time than it would have taken if I would have written it myself. Yeah, kind of I've nice. also seen a visual artist use something like Stable Diffusion, yeah. Mid Journey, etc. Actually, I've used it myself to generate some stuff. But what I get out of it is it doesn't feel creative. It feels rather bland. And so if you want to do something quick, it's fine. Yeah. But by, if you say, okay, first I make something quick and then I'm going to adapt it, then I wonder, but especially in the visual domain, whether you can do that because you start with the wrong thing. You start with something that is already bland. So that I was wondering your yeah, opinion so here. My, for this visual generation, my expectation is that this was just at the beginning. I mean, there will be better ones that look a bit more sophisticated and uh, the artists are still key. It's not that they are replaced by this. They will use this in their own way. So Photoshop already has these kind of tools. And so what artists will do, they will use that and they become skilled in manipulating this in a way that gives new art. And I'm not an artist, but I know they are creative. So I see this more as a tool and how they will use it, I'm not sure. Maybe you're right, maybe it's more time consuming. Although there's a lot of copywriters that generate these kind of texts or these kind of images. So there's a huge market for it, um, but it is not the highest form of art or writing. That, that's probably true. No, but for many things, we just need generic art and we yep. just need generic texts. Yep. So I, th I see, and I'm, uh, I think in, a, in 10 years from now, we see all kinds of applications that we didn't, didn't realize would be possible. But I already see a lot of, and you know, don't know if that will be successful, but I could foresee many potential applications of this technology, but not in the way that they replace the human. The human factor remains very important. Now, so, um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, sure. uh, now, in terms of things that we should not deploy this technology for, I think the guiding principle is trust. Yeah, what we trust this technology to do and what we do not trust this technology to do. Uh, I've co-authored a paper on you know, whether ChatGPT can be considered trustworthy uh, with Esther Kimolan, uh, who is a professor at Tilburg Law School and with, with whom I'm working on issues of trustworthy AI and the paper is presently under review, but uh, the 
we began with reliability in terms of information, but the question of trust involves a lot of other things in terms of transparency, in terms of human oversight, in mm -hmm. terms of legal compliance, ethical and technological robustness. And on all significant issues where uh, it impacts human interests, unless an AI system can be considered to be trustworthy, we should not deploy it. The problem with the hype, as you mentioned rightly in the beginning, is that in, at a uh, breathtaking speed, this technology is getting incorporated in ways that we do not understand. For example, a judge, I think, uh, uh, okay, pardon my memory, uh, recently admitted to using ChatGPT yeah. for uh, coming out with uh, research uh, and, and sections of uh, a judgment. I'm forgetting the name of the country, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, that to me is of great concern. If a lawyer is using chat GPT or any large language model for coming up with first draft of a contract, and let's assume that the confidential information, the personal information pertaining to the clients have been put into that. Now, that's a significant privacy concern for, uh, for those clients. So in any of these areas or areas where determination of interests have to be made in a judicious manner, uh, any kind of government services, uh, I do not think we should even remotely consider incorporating mm. large language models there. But, but as we have seen with previous technologies, it would happen. Yes, yes, yes. And, Correct. And, and, and that is, I think, the larger ethical concern that we should perhaps address. Uh, this really is a moment of introspection for all the developers, for all the deployers and all, all people who consider AI as a potential source for good, that the speed with which we are breaking this, we are likely to replicate the errors which we have made with other forms of technology. For example, when social media came uh, first came, everybody was really excited with its democratic potential, but we have seen how things went awry. Now, one concern with, for example, a large language model is in terms of systemic disinformation. Rob Dyke and others in their, in their book, it's a wonderful book, System Error, they talk about what would happen if the cost of spreading disinformation decreases with yeah. creation of synthetic media. Yeah. And, and with these models, that cost is minuscule. And if that be the case, then we have another problem at, at our hand. So uh, in all, I mean, if we cannot, con if we do not consider the system to be trustworthy, we should proceed with extreme caution. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, but you also say you, it's going to be used for things. Uh, that, and I th and that's what my own idea about all of AI is actually. Uh, so there's not inherently any danger in all these advanced AI techniques. The danger is in, people using it for things that it wasn't meant for yeah. or people trusting it too much like they, they take self-driving cars i mean you tap into the self-driving car it, it seems to work you drive around and you keep your hands on the wheel and then you, you, you do it on, and then the third time think okay this works and you lean back and you fall asleep and then the car drives into a river uh, so that because people start to rely on it because well it went right they correct the first time it went correct the second time so now it's fine and, and i think that is where a, a lot of the danger especially for these kind of tools is especially because they they seem to deliver something that sounds like it's reliable i'll, I'll just add a caveat to that okay go ahead i think we should first address the question whether the problem at hand is something that should be solved in a technological manner? Is this something which is a perfect information? It's not a game of chess or go where move 37 has existential implications only for all those wonderful players who play that game. This has existential implications. I mean, technologies uh, which are disruptive in nature, which has some real life implications. We have seen what, for example, not related to large language models, but what deployment of AI system can do in terms of social benefits and discrimination uh, related issues relating to that. So the first question is whether technology at all should be 
involved in drafting the solution for the problem at hand? Second, do we have adequate data? Do we have the right data? The, whether the data sets, what kind of biases do they exist? Mm. And can, can we get rid of that bias? To what extent can we get rid of that bias? Is there accountability? Is there transparency? Is there human oversight? Is, there, is it possible to contest the outcomes? These are all issues which address the trustworthy angle. Yeah. And unless we can address them in a satisfactory manner, large language models can only have very limited applications in a wide societal uh, context. So maybe I can briefly comment on the bias. So yeah. Um, yeah. anybody working in machine learning knows every model has a bias. It is necessary, otherwise you cannot generalize. Yes. It's even true for humans. Yeah. So I think, um, my thing about these biases is that, of course, you want to avoid biases, but in these models, it's more transparent what these biases are because you can check it. It's more transparent yeah. than humans. Yeah. So I always envision that you would, if, if everybody would be able to test these models and uh, that it would be detected by the community, this model is, bi is, is biased in that respect. And then as a community, you have to decide if you want that or not. That's now not possible because these models are uh, developed by these companies tech companies. So I think we should move to a situation where we as a community can have a file a complaint if we detect something like that. And I think that's an advantage with respect to humans because we do know that humans discriminate and humans uh, do not behave in an unbiased way. No, yeah, sure. So you could also make the case that these models, in, if properly introduced and embedded in a structure that we don't have yet, uh, would be advantageous because at least you could check it and verify it that they are biased. There's no excuse if you test it and you see what well, this case is comparable to this case and it's only on one factor, gender or something, and it makes a difference. So then you, you kind of crash test these systems while they are operating. I think that's the only solution if you want to use it. Um, and I think that's an advantage with respect to humans because nowadays you see that humans, when you look at politics, is a lot of discrimination, a lot of biases sometimes also unknown biases. Yes, that's um, I think a big issue. Yeah, and about this dangers of AI, I fully agree with what you're saying, but in fact, we're already victim to these kind of things because these little machine learning algorithms behind every news page and every news outlet in social media is uh, effectuating everything you read in the papers, that you get these polarizations. I think our society is not ready for these systems. And that was, I think, what you referred to, that yes. we missed that. Yeah. We were too late, but there was, were warnings that we should be careful. And now it's happening. And uh, if I talk to young people, they, they, they liked it, they, they grew up with this system. But I think we have to need, we need something in place to regulate, make this more regulated or something uh, without obstructing the developments of these techniques because I still believe that they can be very helpful also for attacking problems that we face. I'm going to slightly uh, take a different viewpoint on this. Um, my colleague uh, at law school, uh, Lynette Taylor, she's done wonderful work in the realm of data justice. Yeah. And one theme there is in terms of intersectionality. The way we have come to understand our world in terms of, let's say, different social groups, in terms of race, gender, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. in, uh, and this is where the question of bias and explainability becomes, uh, at least to my understanding, uh, uh, a, a really huge challenge, which we are nowhere close to solving. At intersectionality of these multiple focal points in terms of nationality, religion, gender, race, the way an AI system is computing and coming out with the outcome, I'm not sure it is possible to delineate the source of bias yeah. or the relevant points of bias and say that this is the way we can correct the system. Yeah. And if we cannot do that, then that goes back to the question that I had raised in the beginning, whether this is a problem which can be or should be solved by introduction of AI systems in the first place at all. Uh, so first of all, yeah. it, you can detect it. Uh, finding the source, it could, it could have many sources, but that's irrelevant. It has to be, if I am a company and I provide a service and the service is used widely and it's detected or flagged as, okay, sure. this is uh, not fair or this is uh, discrimination, then it's my responsibility to deal with that. Uh, by the way, there are techniques for that to, to deal with these things. But I think uh, 
you cannot get an explanation it's doing it before because of that you can repair it but the explanation is hard because all these models have a kind of implicit mapping of all this information on output in that sense it can be likened to humans i always give this example when i want in the old days if you wanted to have a mortgage at the bank and it was rejected a guy in a suit the clear guy in a suit would tell you and give you an explanation why it was rejected and you didn't like it but you went home and you said okay that's a pity and now it's a machine and this machine can at least be checked if it's correct and 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 fair and this guy in a suit might have said that for another reason you don't know but i'm not i'm not completely sure uh, about what you're now saying because first of all what is bias suppose i say look uh uh, children have a smaller shoe size than adults. Yeah, that's a bias, but it's yeah. it's completely explainable. So is this really an, 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 a bias that is there? Uh, you can detect it uh, that the system has that, that but it's not um, a wrong thing to have in the system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you also have biases which are because of cultural um, ideas. Um, uh, okay, we, we know lots and lots of examples, but the problem with these kind of biases is that um, you you start zooming in on them. They become bigger over time because, and especially with these kind of systems like ChatGPT, is a biased system. We can detect that, yeah, yeah. and it's not weird because it's biased because it is trained on text and text from the internet and not everybody writes on the internet not every topic is on the yep. internet so there's a bias there and then people are going to use chat gpt to generate new text which they publish on the internet so the bias becomes bigger and you you should be able to, to reduce it but how can you detect whether a bias is a, a bias that is acceptable and when is it not acceptable. Yeah, that's why I said at the beginning that this is this development should not be restricted to AI researchers. You need multiple disciplines who study these cases. And I could imagine you have a kind of certification board that is keeping track of that. Or, but I'm not saying it's easy, but it's necessary because. Um, and I think the example that you mentioned with the shoe size is easy. But I think if there is a bias detected that really violates the ro the rules and regulations of a country or a nation. And I can see all these obstacles, but you don't have, shouldn't forget that our society also has these same obstacles. Yes. Not everybody is reading the papers. Not everybody writes books, and and still they the people that write books have more impact on society. So I think this is not only a technological issue; it's also cultural, and uh, so that that's why all the disciplines should be involved here. And it's, I think actually Tilburg University has a good profile to to study this from all sides and to come up with potential solutions. Anything you want to add to that? <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> uh, yeah, no time, sure. Oh, well, no, I, I was thinking there's probably yeah. something that you have a lot to say about. <laughs> well, the issue of bias in the AI system, I think, well, we should perhaps do a separate podcast on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of forms of bias. Um, sure. It's. Um, that then round it off. <laughs> yes. um, in context of the concerns that we have, one way of understanding bias is having an unjustified positive or negative disposition towards a social group or a person belonging to a particular social group. Yeah. Now, these biases are reflected in our daily reality. They get accentuated and multiplied when they're deployed by AI systems. The example that Eric gave in terms of uh, somebody getting denied a loan application by the man in suit. Well, one way of perhaps making the distinction is that that denial in some sense is on the merit of an individual application mm -hmm. that you do not satisfy these criteria. Mm -hmm. When an AI system is making the computation, the model is not just focusing on that individual's data, but the computation is taking place in larger socioeconomic context and by virtue of that collaborative filtering, then it's not just this person or her outcome which is being determined in light of her life actions, but in terms of the larger consequences. Now, this is a, not an AI 
example, but I think this example perhaps makes the point. Uh, during the course of the pandemic in UK, there was an A grade level controversy where school children who were about to take their final examinations, they could not because of the pandemic. Yep. Yes. And their grades were, if I recall correctly, were a mix of the grade that their teachers gave and also what an algorithm moderated on the basis of the past performance of the school, yep. Yep. which naturally penalized schools from those areas which are socially and economically disadvantaged. Yes. And hence there were these placards that judge me, not my postcode. Yes. So when an AI system does that, the bias gets multiplied and accentuated in these ways which we do not presently understand. So I don't think the and all the quite works in the same way that yes, of course there is bias in the real world, but the way it gets uh, no, I agree because that was not the intention yeah, to stretch the analogy yeah, that yeah. way because it was only that the explainability of a human yeah. is not always because that's, that's the true. kind of gold standard we yeah. use explainability of a human yeah. but that but okay you're right it's uh, you shouldn't stretch this analogy to uh, it, it links to something else uh, because it came up now a bit yeah. because biases are also culturally determined but these biases currently that are in something like chat GPT are within a particular culture, yep. which would mean that if you want to have this technology be used, let's say, all over the world uh, for good, uh, we can think of good applications, then you will have to train it for different culture. That's already happening. Sure. And that's all because I also said Microsoft and Google developed their own ladder. And there is a lot involved in doing this training. You already mentioned all these people that get involved and that's not all ethically uh, um, responsible um, and there's also things like uh, the ecological impact of creating such models well it, they still seem to be some kind of playthings but I know there is a lot of energy going into these kind of models and um, um, what is there something that you can say about this so how should we so should we really stimulate the development of all these models for different cultures, if you think about that. Well, we're not stimulating no, anything because these companies are doing that. Well, we do but, because we're going to use it and that's why yeah, you know, we also want to have our model. And, yeah, and I think uh, that will happen. That's yeah. unavoidable. I, I'm sure that in China these models are there by Baidu or they, they are developing it. Mm -hmm. So there are many cultures and, and, and that will happen. But as I said, this is a kind of development phase. So the whole AI hype from the last 10 years is built on the algorithms that are still in development. So every week they become better or improved. And uh, the, 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 the dangerous thing is that they're already applied by companies that really benefit. Facebook uses these simpler machine learning algorithms, and I guess Google also uses these kind of large language models to get more uh, revenue from the searches. So I think, uh, and that's unprecedented because normally you had something developed and then it was put on the market, but now it's already in the market before it's ready. And, and that means that we will have a phase where you have all this, these variants and cultural variants. Uh, by the way, for cultural scientists, it's very interesting to study <laughs> these models because you might learn a lot. But I think, again, that's something that requires efforts from uh, lawmakers, but also from scientists to study this, how you should do this in a proper way. I know that the European Union has this ambition to work uh, on a proper implementation of AI. And they have this whole leaflet with all kinds of rules and regulations, but it's it's not easy. It's very difficult. No, it was one of the things that they often say is, that, yeah, it should be explainable. It should be transparent. Yeah. Well, these models, by their nature, are not transparent. No. They might provide some explanations. They can. Uh, it's like a chat GPT. They can generate explanations that like people like, but that doesn't mean that they are <laughs> truthful. <laughs> so, no, that's a great question. Um, Dimit Gebru and others in their wonderful parrot, uh, paper, Stochastic Parrots, right, where they talk about the financial and environmental cost of training large language models. They refer to one really interesting aspects where those parts of the world which would face the impact of climate change perhaps will really not benefit from using large language models. Mm -hmm. And it's not even in those languages. And I think if, if, if memory serves me right, they term it as a form of environmental racism, 
in 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 one yes. respect. I was recently uh, reading this article on Wired, where uh, sorry, there's just so much information. So I, I, I'm hedging everything <laughs> that I'm saying. Ask <laughs> He or it <laughs> knows. Uh, so, uh, now, I, if memory serves me correct, uh, then the information there was that uh, to train a large language model like this results in transmission equivalent to a person taking. 550 round trips between New York and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Now on the positive side, somebody may say that once that training is done, well then in the longer run, this is a better solution for the environment. The problem with that is the arms race in terms of who can first monetize a large language model, who can integrate it with search engine and if this is a cost of training a large language model once, then the cost of training it again and again or to, running, uh, to run it as part of an integrated search engine would perhaps be significantly higher. So in that sense, the, I, I think there, at least in the shorter run, there is a significant environment cost to uh, developing this technology. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's an area I think we should be increasingly focusing more on in an interdisciplinary manner. Yeah, so I, I agree with this, but on the other hand, I think it's a bit a, a strange situation because there are many things that cost a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you see that climate research and actually a lot of fields of research are having a boost oh, to deep yes. learning. Mm -hmm. And this boost leads already to all kinds of innovations like better solar panels, etc. And it's hard to predict where, how yes. this will balance out. Yes. But to focus on one technology and say, well, of course, uh, using so much uh, energy for one such a model seems awkward and strange but on the other hand this is this is a technology that goes forward okay. and with this technology i think we need it very hard to solve this actually the most problematic issue of our planet is not ai at this moment it's climate change and yes. maybe uh, hopefully at least at least you can already see points that, that this deep learning might help there to by building uh, better models yeah build okay. better models better climate models uh, chemistry has helped a lot so yes i think ho my hope is that that will help of course there's no guarantee and i think we should be concerned about energy use and be careful with that but um it's a bit of a one-sided story to focus only on these models because it's much broader. Okay, well, that uh, I think that is a very positive uh, view uh, on at least this aspect. Indeed, that we shouldn't worry too much about the energy consumption, but there are other things that we can worry about. Um, uh, things like the, the aspects of, um, you already mentioned education, you already mentioned the job market, although there are positive things there as well, but things like how people interact with each other, I can imagine that it has impact there. Um, how um, I already see that um, um, uh, criminals are using ChatGPT to generate spam. Yep. The spam becomes a lot more natural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I see, but that is of course misuse of technology that we are then talking about. Yep. Is there something that we can say about that or that we can do about these kind of things or should we just accept that or? I mean, I think every technology is open to misuse. What is of concern to me and perhaps to many researchers who are working uh, in, in the field is the lack of conversation. This technology or te these large language models or disruptive AI systems are in some sense inflicted on the society without even initiating a conversation with all stakeholders. Let's start with academia. You're looking at a sector which was run to the ground where researchers and academics suffered burnt out during the course of the pandemic while trying to do their job to the best of their abilities far exceeding in terms of uh, what was really required, but still trying to provide and look out for the best interest of their students. And they were just beginning to recover from that. And now suddenly this new question props up, well, whether what I am assessing, whether that's a legitimate answer or not. I do not for one moment believe that somebody who was developing a technology as disruptive as a large language model could not foresee this misuse. Yeah. 
going forward, and, and you can come up with multiple examples in terms of how uh, creators have been impacted by disruptive AI. Now, yes, to the other side, somebody could say, well, you cannot have this conversation uh, uh, every time there is a significant innovation, but there has to be at least a modicum of a conversation, and that's where a regulatory oversight or an ethical oversight, I think, uh, uh, becomes really interesting because we spoke about jobs. It's not a question of what jobs AI systems would replace. It's a, it's a question of what jobs we want AI systems to replace. We do not want our agency to be replaced in a manner which is not of our choosing. There are certain jobs which AI systems can do far better than humans and they should. And there are certain jobs which AI systems presently are not equipped and perhaps maybe never will be equipped to address. And that's part of that larger conversation. That example that you mentioned in terms of Crim, uh, criminal use of this technology or systemic disinformation on account of this technology. That's a part of a larger conversation, but that conversation never took place. Mm. There's this uh, paper on regulatory entrepreneurship, uh, which talks about how these big tech corporations exploit this gray area in regulations and then change regulations almost through lobbying and through their uh, contestation of legal actions. And in that sense, it's the technology is not just the training of the model, it's also the business model. You have taken people's existence, capitalized it, surveillance capitalism at its finest, and now that's part of a data set. And now that's being used for assigning probabilities to text. And we do not know how the privacy and the bias concerns have been addressed with. The conversation never took place. So in no, but don't don't such conversations take a long time? Well, the developments in the technology go incredibly fast. Yes, and that's why we usually end up in the mess that we do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then people say, hey, "I will solve it for us later." Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I think that, that this is a slow process and we were too late with the upcoming of the internet and now we're again too late because it's so fast. But that's actually why we have this conversation here and why we are active as researchers to try to address these things. Um, but not by pushing all the time on what's wrong, but also seeing what you can do and find a proper balance. Be and there's no easy solution, but um, I always realize that these same technology concerns that are always the bad guys allowed an enormous opening up of our world. I mean, uh, I, I feel like granddaddy talks if I tell my students that I had to go to the library and wait for hours <laughs> for the book to learn something about quantum mechanics. And now you press one button and you get all the information. I think that's that's the good side. So there's, I see these dangers and I think we should address them, but we should also be aware of the enormous uh, uh, virtues of, of having opened up the world. And now the, the question is, how do we use this knowledge to somehow deal with that to, to prevent this mess from happening? Because I can see that, that it's, you can read it in the papers every day. But I think it's too easy to blame these companies. These companies are just a kind of emergent property of the commercial system and capitalism. So in a sense, we created ourselves because we gave, we, I have a Google account and I, of course, I have to admit, I never read the small and I don't care, but you're right, they're using information. These diffusion models, there was somebody who found images in, generated by diffusion yeah. models of private uh, medical data. <laughs> so, I mean, these companies just use any data they, they can use. And this has to, of course, be regulated somehow. And that takes longer than, uh, I think our regulatory system is too slow and cannot be fast, but that will happen sooner or later. And um, and as I said, we need multiple disciplines to deal with that. Okay, I uh, I liked it as close. Do you want to make uh, some kind of closing statement on this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on the um, regulatory front, there are multiple approaches that uh, one can see at the moment. For example, the proposed EU AI Act seeks to take a more comprehensive uh, approach to AI systems. There are a lot of problems with uh, the way it's going about it and I don't think it can effectively regulate large language models. There's a wonderful paper by Philip Hacker and others uh, which addresses the challenges of uh, why large language models cannot be effectively regulated under the EU AI Act. Um, 
there are other uh, approaches the one that i think is completely wrong is the no regulation approach which okay. us and other countries and some other countries have adopted uk has an approach where it is sort of trying to address the impact through different legislations through privacy through human rights legislation and so on and so forth but the way it is withdrawing from the sphere of human rights at a, uh, a with 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 the, with the impact of brexit i'm not sure whether that will work um so i'm not sure we whether we have really sorted the regulatory approach but there are multiple approaches which we have uh, working on the problem at the moment so there's hope for the future it's nice to end in a <laughs> optimistic note well if you would allow me one last cynical take on this uh I've been thinking about the issue of hope for the past few days, and my concern is that anytime we end on a hope, hopeful note, uh, people who are perhaps listening to the podcast or somebody who is reading about these topics gets into this false sense of comfort that somebody somewhere is doing something about this. <laughs> and the scientists have been warning about climate change for decades and so many years, and that was never paid any heed to. In surveillance studies, people spoke about privacy concerns for decades, but that was never paid heed to. So I would say let's end on a moment of introspection, but <laughs> hope, well, yes, in some sense, without hope, there is uh, never a call for action. So to that extent, hope is certainly important, but perhaps a compromise in the nature of introspection. <laughs> 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 okay, we leave with that. Thank you. Thank you very much.